Welcome to our series on motion in one dimension. In this series, we will explore many types of vertical motion, frames of reference, momentum and impulse, as well as elastic and inelastic collisions. In this first lesson, we're going to explore the motion of falling objects. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe and explain downwards vertical projectile motion and draw the relevant graphs of motion for a downwards vertical projectile. In grade 10, you would have learned about the motion of objects such as a ball rolling along a table. This simple horizontal motion is described as being in the X plane. So the displacement of change in position of an object is given by delta x. This vertical motion is described as being in the y plane. For this reason, the displacement of change in position of an object is given by delta y. We have a guest today waiting patiently in front of her webcam. Nambulela, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Sibu. Good to have you. I believe you have a question about motion. Yes, Sibu. I'm a bit confused about vertical motion. Well, I'll be able to help you because today we are going to investigate the properties of an object's motion when it moves vertically or in the Y plane. In this lesson, we will investigate objects moving downwards only. That's great. Thank you. First, I have a question for you. Do you know any examples of downwards motion? Hmm. Let's see. Rocks falling down? Oh, there must be many more. Yes, there are plenty of examples. Now, can you tell me who the first person was to recognize the law of gravitation? Ah, I know that. It was Sir Isaac Newton. That's right, Nomulelo. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to describe how objects fall to the Earth in his law of universal gravitation. An apple falling from a tree showed Newton how gravity works. I remember learning about gravity before. It's a force that pulls things towards the Earth, isn't it? Newton's law tells us that gravity is a force that attracts objects to the center of the Earth. The size of this force of gravity depends on the mass of each object and the distance between them. Objects fall towards the Earth because they are attracted to the Earth. The Earth doesn't move towards these objects because it has a significantly bigger mass than the falling objects. The acceleration at which objects fall towards the Earth is known as the acceleration due to gravity. It has the value of 9,8 meters per second squared. Let's do an experiment to prove that an object will fall at 9,8 meters per second squared. Legend is going to drop a small ball below a motion detector. While the ball is falling, the motion detector will record the velocity of the ball. Legend placed a meter ruler along this stand here. This is so that we can calculate the acceleration of the ball over a specific distance. We'll be using this distance marked here, which is half a meter. He'll drop the ball from several different heights above the marked part. Can you think why he has to do this? Did you remember that we always need to repeat an experiment several times to check the accuracy and reliability of our results? Do you have a pen, paper and calculator? Then let's begin. First, we need to draw a table to record all our results. I'd like to check something here. What information do we need to put into the table? We have to record the first and last velocities as measured by the motion detector and the distance. Don't forget to include the units. We also include a column for the value of acceleration that we will calculate at the end of the experiment. That's great help. Thanks. Are we ready to begin the investigation now? Yes. Watch as he drops the ball. We'll call this test one. By looking at the readings, we can see that the first velocity is 3,87 meters per second, and the second has a reading of 4,98 meters per second. Remember that the distance over which we are measuring is half a meter, so we can automatically record this too. Before we move on to the second test, let's calculate the acceleration of the first ball. 
we have the following information. The initial velocity of first reading has a value of 3,87 meters per second. The final velocity, the second reading, has a value of 4,98 meters per second. The distance traveled is half a meter. Note that instead of using delta x, we now use delta y to indicate displacement as the ball is moving in the y plane. So because we have all these values, I'm using the equation vf squared equal to vi squared plus 2 times a times delta y. This will allow us to calculate acceleration. Now that we have the equation, let's substitute in what we know. We have final velocity, 4,98 squared equal to initial velocity, 3,87 squared plus 2 times a times 0, 0,5. This gives us 24,80 equal to 14,98 plus 2a times 0, 0,5. We need to try to make the acceleration the subject of the formula, so we subtract 14,98 from both sides. For the right-hand side of the equation, we multiply 2a by a half and get a, the acceleration. So a equals 9,82 meters per second squared. Let's record the acceleration experienced by the ball in our table. This value is very close to the accepted value of acceleration due to gravity on 9,8 meters per second squared. Let's do another three tests and record the results. In test two, we can see that the first velocity reading is 3,72 meters per second, and the second velocity reading is 4,86 meters per second. Remember, the distance over which we are measuring is still half a meter. In test three, we found that the initial velocity is 3,955 meters per second, and the final velocity is 5,05 meters per second. And then in the last test, the initial velocity was 4,76 meters per second, and the final velocity was 5,69 meters per second. We've collected all the results, so we must calculate the acceleration in every test. We do this by using the same equation as for the first test. Oh, that was quick. This is interesting. I can complete the table. The acceleration for the second test was 9,78 meters per second squared. For test three, the acceleration was 9,86 meters per second squared. And for test four, it was 9,72 meters per second squared. I'm sure you've noticed something here. Can you think of possible reasons for this? Did you think of the correct answer? There is always experimental era when performing experiments. This is the reason why we repeat tests several times in order to record more accurate results. Okay, now we can find the average of the acceleration calculated. To do this, we need to add all four of the accelerations together and then divide by four we end up with an average acceleration of 9,795. When we round this off, we get 9,8 meters per second squared. This is the value that we expected, isn't it? This means that we have proved that objects fall with an acceleration of 9,8 meters per second squared towards the Earth. This applies to all objects falling under the same conditions. It's important to remember that the acceleration of an object as it moves towards the Earth is a constant value when air resistance is ignored. This doesn't change even if an object is initially thrown down instead of dropped. All this has been so helpful. But don't we need graphs to illustrate motion? Yes, Nombulelo, we are going to consider the shapes of various graphs of motion that can be drawn for vertically downwards motion. We conducted an experiment similar to our first experiment and obtained the following set of results. 
The only thing is, this experiment measured the distance the ball traveled from the start and recorded at one second intervals. It doesn't measure the velocity of the ball while it fell. After one second, the ball had fallen 4,9 meters. And after two seconds, it had fallen to 19,6 meters. By the time three seconds had passed, the ball had already fallen to 44,1 meters. There's something strange here. After every second, the ball fell a bigger distance than in the second before. What's going on? That's because the ball is experiencing a constant acceleration. Let's look at a graph of this. Using these results, we can draw a graph of the position of the ball over time. Remember that time must be on the x-axis because it is the independent variable. So the position, also known as the displacement, must be on the y-axis. Make sure when you draw the graph that you label both axes and that you include the correct SI units. The shape of this position versus time graph is a hyperbole, which is a curve like this. The graph becomes steeper here. Can you think why, Nombulelo? I think, as the ball accelerates towards Earth, the velocity of the ball increases at a constant rate. Correct, Nombulelo. This shape of this graph probably looks familiar to you. The curve of the graph indicates that the ball was undergoing constant or uniform acceleration. The constant acceleration experienced by a falling object is the acceleration due to gravity, which has a value of 9,8 meters per second squared. In this experiment, we also measured the velocity of the ball during each second of its fall. The results are shown in the last column of the table. Now, from these results, we'll plot a graph of velocity against time for the downward motion. Once again, time is the independent variable and must be on the x-axis. And don't forget to put in the correct SI units as well. What do you notice about the shape of the velocity versus time graph? It's clearly a straight line through the origin because the acceleration experienced by the ball is constant. This means that the rate of change of velocity is constant. So every second the velocity increases by the same amount. If the velocity versus time graph is not a straight line, then the acceleration is not constant or uniform. Because the graph is a straight line, it is possible to calculate the acceleration of the ball using the graph. Do you remember how to do this? I have forgotten that. Can you please remind me how it's done? Okay, then. First, we need to calculate the gradient. We do this by dividing the change in the velocity by the change in time between two points. Here, velocity changes from 19,6 to 49 meters per second squared over this period of time, two to five seconds. So acceleration is calculated from the gradient, which is delta V, the change in velocity, divided by delta T, the change in time. This means that we find the gradient from V2 minus V1 divided by T2 minus T1. Let's calculate the gradient from the two points shown on the graph. This will be equal to 49 minus 19,6 divided by 5 minus 2. This gives us 29,4 divided by 3. And the final answer is then 9,8 meters per second squared. This is the value we would expect if our results were accurate. When an object is accelerating due to gravity, we can use any two points on the graph and you would get exactly the same answer every time. Now let's look at the acceleration versus time graph. Once again, time is on the x-axis as it is the independent variable. The acceleration is on the y-axis. The graph is a straight line parallel to the x-axis. This is because the acceleration experienced by the ball is uniform and is a result of the gravitational pull of the Earth. 
Throughout this lesson, we've been making a very important assumption. We've assumed that the direction of movement downwards is what we call positive. Remember that displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all vectors. So they all have magnitude or size and must have a direction too. In all our calculations and graphs, we have made the downward direction the positive direction. If we were to choose the upward direction as positive, then the acceleration experienced by our ball would be negative 9,8 meters per second squared. Remember though, acceleration due to gravity always acts downwards, regardless of the direction of motion of the object. This brings us to your task for this lesson. Redraw the three graphs of motion we have developed, making the positive direction upwards. List similarities and differences in the shapes of these three graphs.